Thank you again for having me. It's a great pleasure to, to be here today. I've been attending the two previous editions of the conference, waiting to have something to present, and I'm coming today with, uh, with great news. Indeed, my name is Florent Dufour. If it's not obvious already, I am French. I am a computational biologist and data scientist, and I'm working at the LRZ, the Lightning Supercomputing Center, in the big data and AI team, where we are building a cloud for medical research. I'm also associated with the Technical University in Munich, and I'm pursuing a PhD uh, in AI medicine there. So those will be actually the two parts of this talk, and maybe we should start with the very first one, this Bavarian cloud for, for health research. And as the name suggests, this story is taking place in, uh, in Bavaria, and there's a bunch of uh, of researchers trying to build the medicine of the future there. For us, the medicine of the future is P4, is P4 medicine, which is a type of medicine that is predictive, preventive, personalized, and also uh, participatory. So we don't develop this medicine from scratch. We actually focus on cardiovascular disease. And I know we are not all biologists in the room, but if there's anything to know about the, the heart, is that it's an important organ in, uh, in the body. And it's also subject to atherosclerosis, which is this abnormal formation of plague in the arteries, leading to kind of the blockage of the, the flow of blood in your body. And this is not what you want. What you want is, is blood to flow in your body, especially uh, in your brain. And this heart disease is actually a big problem because they account for 32% of all death on, the, on this planet, which is actually the number one cause of death. It's also costing tons of money on the, on the health system. And as you can see on this picture, we show the difference of these arteries between someone healthy on the left and someone not so healthy on the right. This is someone who's like maybe spending too much time at the beer garden, having beer and eating schnitzel. And that's actually something we know. We know there are common risk factors for this heart disease to, to develop. If you smoke, if you don't eat so much healthy, if you don't do so much physical activity, if you have a harmful use of alcohol or medication, this is stuff we know which can lead you to developing this kind of disease. However, there's some other individual risk prediction that we can't perform so well. There's some stuff we don't know. Like, for example, we don't know how genetics play a role in this. We don't know also how proteins play a role in developing this uh, disease. And this is where our research is taking place. And this is why we are working on it. We are trying to understand the difference between the left picture, someone who has a unstable plague, and someone on the right, uh, left stable and on the right uh, unstable and someone who's subject to this. This is actually um, a very hard problem, but this is also a very good beginning for developing this medicine of the future. This is a big research project. This is funded by the Bavarian Ministry of Health. We have 14 institutions, more than 100 researchers working together, around 25 million of uh, euros also invested. And you can see as many work, as many research projects, we are divided in work packages. We have eight actually. The three first, you can see them in purple. Those are domain scientists and cardiologists. So what they do, they actually take people and they open them and they look inside what's happening. They look inside the heart. They look inside the arteries. They also take samples on the people. We have the epidemiology people. We have the multi-omic people. Those people will be doing all the DNA sequencing, all the proteomics also. And we also have the ethics and legal people. So they do the proposal for actions and guidance, and they kind of make sure we don't do anything too crazy uh, with the patients. And there is us, there's actually the cool kids and the work package number six, which is the IT infrastructure. And this is what we are focusing on uh, today. And this is developing the IT infrastructure to support this whole research, which includes the storage, the storage of big data by the sequencing people, and also the secure computing and uh, this is happening at the LRZ, the supercomputing center here in Munich. And this is the IT center of excellence for university. We are not a company. We are owned by the, um, by, by the people, by the public, and we are supporting research. You may know the LRZ because it's housing the, the famous SuperMOOC NG. And this is this high performance computer. And we're also providing other services like a big cloud, data science storage and uh, archiving providing also systems for AI, future computing, quantum computing, and uh, the upcoming next generation of high-performance computer, the, the Examoc. So if you look at the LRZ, this is actually a big house. This is a big IT center with around 260 employees. We are operating big system like the SuperMOOC NG, thousands of nodes, millions of core uh, hour a year. We also have like quite a, a bit of storage, 70 petabyte of hot storage, 260 petabyte for archival, and plenty of GPUs and accelerators. We also operate a cloud that is OpenStack-based uh, and Ceph-based for the, for the storage, hundreds of nodes, 
two petabytes of storage. And in total, I think there's like around uh, 1,500 active VMs as we are talking now. So if you look at the RZ, it seems like it must be the perfect place to actually host and support this, this research for, for heart disease. And we looked into the statistics. It seems like the RZ services are mostly used by physicists, a bit of chemists, and there's not actually so many people doing biomedical research on those systems. They are very beefy. We have plenty of storage. We would be very happy to host all those genomes, all those exomes, and so on. And yet, if you look into this, uh, the graph, the, the gray part, biomedical research is underrepresented. So we came to our partners, to all the people uh, working with us within the project and asking, what, uh, what is your use case? On a daily basis, what do you use? How do you work? And what do we need to build um, for you to, to, to support your research? And we had so many answers. And it showed like how heterogeneous the workloads of biologists are. The people operating at the petabyte scale and they need at least 800 cores to perform the research they want. And there's some people who say, oh no, just a laptop is fine. There's people who have very organized database, like organized data sets in databases, MySQL, MongoDB, Neo4g, and some other people who say, ah, we perform research in Excel sheets. We know it's sensitive data, so the Excel sheet is password protected. So you see, it's like this whole bunch of people, and we felt like it's going to be quite hard to build something to support all the, the use cases. So we went at the at the at the at the whiteboard trying to design, and it became very obvious to us we need a cloud. We need to provide something that is elastic and something that is beefy enough to support all the researchers. And most importantly, it must be the place when they come, they know they will have a safe environment that is secure and legally compliant, so they can put all the data inside and securely process them. We took a few examples and we contacted people operating this type of clouds and trying to do also medical research, and we've learned so much. It became very obvious for us that this cloud we were building needs to be secure, and that's why we went for this AMD SCV. We waited for the latest generation of chips, the Milan generation, to, to be released, and we built everything around this uh, CPU architecture. The cloud is architected around the black box, uh, threat model, everything is end-to-end -end encrypted, and we provide multi-tenancy. Everything is segregated, and all the users, they are separated uh, within the cloud. We felt like it was also very important for it to scale because we were building the foundation of what will become a standard service of the computing center for supporting all the um, medical research within Bavaria and hopefully also across Germany. So it's built around scalable technology. We also figured we are a small team and we are not AWS, we are not Asia, so we need to keep it like simple and with low overhead. So everything is provided as a self-service. We use OpenStack for you for researchers to provision compute resources, and we use Quobyte uh, file system for the for the backend instead of Ceph. It was very also exciting to go with AMD SCV because it allowed us to come to our users and say, you can migrate everything to our cloud without modifying modificating your code, which means you can run Python, you can run R, you can run all your stuff without modifying it. And finally, it also needs to be cost efficient. We want to run on commodity hardware that is like easy to scale out and that has uh, reduced um, operations because once again, we are quite a small team. And those are the pictures of the baby cloud as it was born. Actually, it's uh, I'm getting a bit emotional when I see it because it's like we had the chance to build everything from the ground up. We had like all the choices. We chose the power supply up to the software stack we run on this cloud, specifically tailored for the use case and specifically tailored for the researchers and for the, the partners. And this is actually the advantage of working with the LRZ and keeping academia within the academic environment. Let me give you maybe two examples before closing this part of the talk. The very first one is something we are currently migrating to the cloud. And this is this end-to-end -end NGS pipeline. And this is a massive example. This is a very large project that is a integrated service to a system to manage all the next generation sequencing uh, facility. Everything from RNA-seq, chip-seq, exome, up to genome sequencing. So this is the whole nine yards toolkit for NGS. With this system, we can, uh, manage the sample measurement, everything is pseudonymized. It also allows you to manage the wet lab, the data analysis and all the pipelines. And it comes with a, a web UI, as you can see on the screen on the, on the bottom right, that allows you to see all your samples, to see also the quality control, that allows you also to get all the results. And you can see here the alignments of the, of the sequencing, including the, the mutation that can lead to, to heart disease. 
Second example, um, a bit of small one. This is also a direct um, a use case of Digimed, and this is the Earthfit app, and this is your companion that helps you uh, fight heart disease. So it keeps an eye on you, it keeps an eye on your health, and it keeps you healthy. So for now, everything remains on device. There's no backend to this app. And I would, I'm working also with the developers, and I'm talking to them to see if we can maybe develop a backend to, um, to collect some data with the consent of the patient and do some additional research on this uh, new type of data. Data is acquired on the phone. It's also connected to your Apple Watch. I think there's also a version for Android. So yeah, you're also very welcome to check it on the store, download it, and also partake in the, in the research on heart disease. This is going to be the last slide on the first part of this talk and kind of the lessons we've learned when building this cloud for health research. And the very first lesson we learned the hard way is like big data is actually leading to big problem. Not so much technically, because we know how to operate petabyte scale storage system. We know how to upload them. We know how to manage it. But it was much more about evaluating the criticality, the risk ratio of the data, and also the value of the data. It wasn't clear. We had this chicken and egg problem. We were developing something very secure. And the researcher was like, is it secure enough? We don't know. It's up to you to say it to us. And like we, we had this back and forth of discussion. And the solution for us was to take baby steps, actually. It start with public data sets and show they could trust this cloud. They could start with low sensitivity data and slowly rev up in complexity. We, we've also learned that money isn't always the bottleneck. It's actually very hard for us in, the, in academia to recruit people in the IT, especially as we are competing with companies. They can offer much more, much higher salaries. And we've also learned that money is not a bottleneck for users. And they're actually very keen on spending so much money. And they want to use this academic cloud to support the research. And we have also learned that we can't throw money at problems like legal framework. This is not something we can, we can buy. We need to build it. We need to, to do it. We've also learned that it's not so easy, actually, to convince people to use the cloud, especially when you're talking to the community, which is used to HPC system and scheduling system, for example. Some other people were used to working um, on the laptop. For us, it doesn't make sense, especially as those IT people within the, the bioinformatics team, they are not system administrators. So providing them with uh, infrastructure as a service is not that easy because suddenly they have to spin a virtual machine, maintain them, and uh, these kind of things. We've also learned that there was plenty of paperwork to be done. It's not so much technically hard to build a cloud, but it's also all the legal stuff that goes around. And you need a very solid legal team to, to do it. We have learned also that it was not always easy to navigate around the shortage of ships with the pandemics. We've also learned that it was very important to educate the people because providing virtual machines even if everything is encrypted, it's up to them to, to secure what's happening. If they want to open it to the internet, then they're fully exposed to the internet. So we are providing also trainings, good practices, and this kind of stuff to help them have something secure on the, on the secure cloud. And also, that it was a bit hard to sometimes to, to co-design something with uh, the operation, operational team. Because we want to do research, we want to do a cloud. I wanted to build something we could break as much as possible, to learn as much as possible. But this is conflicting with the interest of operations. And they want something safe, something that works, and something that is available. And in any case, remaining humble and taking everything as a teaching, because it can always be worse. And there's always, uh, always something, uh, something breaking. So that's the end of part one. I'm very glad, actually, we had a chance uh, in Germany and Bavaria to have the money and the people to build this kind of system owned by the academia, operated by the academia, for the academia. And there's like still many steps to, to take, but this is a very promising beginning. And, and there's some, some more news to come soon. I have maybe two minutes left, so I would like kind of speed up and talk to you about my PhD and how I'm trying to use confidential computing and TEEs for privacy-preserving AI. And I know the, um, the connection between the two is not so easy. So I was trying to kind of build this map to show you how it's connected. And maybe we should start from the very beginning, mathematics. And you know there's like many fields of mathematics, one of which I'm interested in is mathematical decision making and how we can use math to take decisions. This is something you can do with statistics, for example. There's other fields like operation research, control theory. But I'm interested in AI, and AI make use of many mathematics uh, subfield to, to basically take decisions, and more specifically with machine learning, and more specifically in a federated learning topology. And I'm interested in privacy preserving AI and machine learning and how we can protect the model that are trained in a federation of, of people. 
one method you may know is differential privacy. This is a method to ensure protecting the model and the data you're training on. From the attackers, there's other methods, SMPC, secure multi-party computing, homomorphic encryption, and um, recently also TEs. This is exciting. And the problem is very simple. It's like to say, how do we uh, train a joint model between different entities who can't simply put everything in the same bucket? So this is quite like the opposite of what I was presenting before. And say, in the previous example, we built this big cloud. Everyone puts data into it, and we can learn on it. But this time, we can't do it. And I like the, the image on the big book of federated learning to show that there's like prairies. Those are the data silos. They are isolated and very secure. As you can see, there's a fence around them. But the sheep is the model, and goes between the prairies and eat the grass. And that's how it gets trained and how we get a joint model between the, the, the data provider. But this, if, yeah, sorry. Yeah, someone... Sorry, I hate interrupting you, but uh, we have the uh, Intel keynote coming up in two minutes and uh, are a bit over time now. Um, so I think you only have one slide left, right? Yeah, you know what? Let me, let me jump to the next one and to okay. show you like there's many attacks but we can address them with differential privacy and also TEEs. And I have four topics of research. I want to work against model poisoning with, uh, with differential privacy, also part, uh, work with GPUs and explainable AI. And I would just like close on this one. Thank you once again. And say TEEs are very exciting and very cool and there's so much we can do with them. And that's pretty much it. Thank you, everyone. I'm thanking my team, thanking the people at the LRZ, thanking the people from BioM and the Zikimed Consortium. And thanking also my PI, Professor Ruckert and Georg Kaisis at the tomb. <laughs>